Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being with us today. Um, this is my name is Lim Wei Ling, and I'm the president of Baron Waris San Malaysia, and your moderator for this afternoon. This is Baron Waris San Malaysia's first webinar, and we are overwhelmed by the response we have received from all of you. Over the coming months, Baron Waris San will have an exciting, interesting program of webinars, which I hope you will continue to follow and attend. Our speakers are selected and invited for their expertise in their respective fields of interest and join, and join our top program to share their passion for heritage and the experiences they have gained through being involved in heritage programs or restoration and conservation projects over the years. Having taken on, over the reins of Badan Warisan with a new set of committed and passionate council members in January of this year, we are striving to breathe fresh ideas and a new culture of inclusivity and transparency into Badan Warisan Malaysia. We hope to encourage new members to join Badan Warisan and for the younger generation to be more actively involved in preserving and respecting the heritage of Malaysia through outreach programs such as these. I was fortunate to listen to our speaker, architect Lawrence Lowe, speak passionately about the student Stadium Merdeka project a few months ago. And I was deeply moved by the combined efforts that went into re restoring this grand dam of Malaysian architecture, a symbol of our nation's independence. I think we can all agree that there is a great sense of pride when we think of Stadium Merdeka and all that it stands for. If you speak to any Malaysian, everyone has a story about Merdeka Stadium, from the noticeable fried chicken, that used to get there to attending football games or concerts to people remembering that morning on the 31st of August 1957 when as children they were taken to the stadium by their parents to witness and to be part of that historical day. There are strong emotional connections for each of us as Malaysians towards the significance of what August 31st 1957 stands for. For me, although I wasn't around at that time, the blurred flickering black and white footage of that momentous day with Tunku Abdul Rahman shouting, Merdeka, 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 surely is what comes to mind when I think what Merdeka stands for. Our speaker today, Professor Architect Lawrence Lowe, needs no introduction. He is most well known for his high profile conservation projects, which started with the restoration of the Chong Fatsi Mansion, which won the most excellent project under the UNESCO Heritage, um, Asia Pacific Heritage Awards for Culture, Heritage Conservation in the year 2000. Amongst other significant projects that he has worked on from a restorative perspective are the OCBC Bank in Penang on Beach Street, which consists of three adjoining commercial buildings built from 1885 to 1930, as well as the Suffolk House project in Penang, and of course, restoration of both National, of the National and Merdeka Stadiums. He is a graduate of the AA School of Architecture and returned to Penang, Malaysia in 1974 to begin his architecture career. Our speaker has been actively involved in heritage and was a council member of Baden Warisan between the years 1996 to 2000 and was also a past president of Baden Warisan Malaysia from 2014 to 2016. I hope you will each be enlightened and inspired by Lawrence's talk today on the, on the snippets of interesting facts that revolve around how the stadium came to be, as well as the twists and turns of fate that finally led to how Stadium Merdeka was finally preserved and gazetted for Malaysians, by Malaysians. At the end of the talk this afternoon, there will be a survey, which I hope you will partake in, to share with us what you might be interested in learning more about. Before we start our session today, let me share a few basic housekeeping rules with you. The format of today's presentation will be in slide format, followed by a Q&A session. Please feel welcome to submit your questions to our speaker through the chat box, and we will try our level best to, um, to speak, to answer them at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Even if you don't have any questions, please join the conversation and tell us where you're dialing in from. Before you go on, I go on, if you, if you experience connection problems, please cl click the reconnect button 
on the top of the page or refresh your browser and you'll be brought back into the room. Over to you. So a very big thank you to Lawrence for agreeing to be our speaker today. And many thanks to Think City Institute for helping us to facilitate today's talk, the first of many to follow. Over to you, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Wailing. I'm very honored to have you as my moderator. And I'm indeed grateful to Think City Institute for hosting this webinar. A very good afternoon to members of Baden Ryerson Malaysia, colleagues and friends from both home and abroad. Let me declare that this is not a lecture on conservation practice and techniques, but one for me to place on record my personal worldview of Stadium Medica and to share with you the inside story which contains unspoken thoughts, anecdotal conversations, and lasting impressions that still linger on despite the passing of time. It's a place where culture meets memory and history. A few unforgettable personalities, both dead and alive, are key characters in my architectural narrative. And I will introduce them shortly. They have been instrumental in giving meaning to my personal Madeka story and my conservation journey that has been central to my career. The first historical personality is Stanley Edward Jukes, 1913 to 2011. He was responsible for the image on screen, a hand-drawn perspective of the stadium completed in 1957. He designed it and Stadium Nagara, the first major indoor stadium in Asia, completed in 1962. An American architect and engineer, he was the director of Public Works Department, or JKR as it's known today, from 1959 until 1962. A genius at work, his innovations and creative details inspired many of the early generations of local architects, including me. This is an aerial photograph of the site taken soon after Stadium Nagara was completed. It appears in the top center of the slide. If you compare the first and second slides, you have to admire Stanley's drawing skills. He personally drew the perspective in the days before the advent of computers. His accuracy is uncanny. It's unheard of nowadays, and of all this whilst performing his normal daily duties. His engineering achievements for the largest outdoor stadium in Asia at the time of its conception include the invention of three innovations. One, a prefabricated interlocking, reinforced concrete seating system for the terraces. Two, one of the longest cantilevered concrete shell roofs for the grandstand. And three, the tallest pre-stressed structures in the world at that time, with 140-foot tall floodlight towers. These photographs are my favorite before and after scenes of the project. They represent two ends of a timeline spanning 50 years. The black and white was taken in 1957. Most of you will recognize Tunku Abdul Rahman, the first Prime Minister of the Federation of Malaya and Bapak Malaysia, whom I shall refer to simply as Tunku throughout the talk. He's inspecting the stadium with Dukes to his immediate right and with council members of the Football Association of Malaysia or FAM, of which he was the president. To Abdul Razak is on his left. Tunku, the prince and politician in the story, was responsible for the concept of Stadium Medica. It was built by his decree. Behind every great building, there's a successful architect, who was jokes in this instance. And behind every successful architect, there's a patron, who was Tunku. History is full of such examples. In the second image taken in 2007, I'm on the right of Tun Datuk Dr. Ahmad Sarji, or Tun Sarji for short, then President of Baden Ryerson Malaysia and Chairman of Permodulan National Berhad, or PNB, one of Malaysia's largest fund management companies, and most importantly, the savior of the stadium. We were reenacting the patron architect roles 50 years later. I have a mental image of two simultaneous dialogues taking place between Tuku and Sarji, and Jukes and myself, the past speaking with the present. 
The second dialogue helps me to get into the head of Jukes, understand how to restore the stadium by figure out, figuring what his design intentions were. In the light of the hardships, political challenges, and corruption of values that we normal folk are forced to tolerate in our lives today, it is timely that Baden Weissen Malaysia offers this public presentation about a national physical legacy. One, to remind us of our historical high points and achievements as a nation. Two, of the moral foundations on which our nation was built. And three, to share a narrative about our road to independence and nationhood and how against all odds, we managed to recover the spirit of place of Malaysia's most significant heritage icon. The COVID-19 pandemic has masked the ramifications of the financial crisis, which is playing out before our very eyes. But Malaysia's a resilient lot, as resilient as we have been in the last four recessions that I've experienced in my working life. I believe we will survive. Ironically, Stadium Merdeka survived also because of recession, which followed from the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Back in April 1993, Dr. Anwar Musa, Minister of Youth and Sports, announced that the two stadia were to be demolished. Kita tidak boleh terikat dengan sentiment. Ini soalan ringgit dan sen. The UEM Renong Group had been given the mandate by the cabinet to do what we will with the land in exchange for building the indoor and outdoor stadia and hostels for the 1998. Commonwealth Games. To a large extent, Anwar was right. The sentiment then was that heritage conservation was only an elitist indulgence of the intelligentsia, from Dr. Mahathir all the way down the food chain to the man in the street. There was no conservation consciousness to speak of at all. I, I know this for a fact because at that time I was restoring the Chong Fasi mansion. And most observers couldn't see the purpose of it. They thought I had embarked on a fool's mission. In the book, the Madeka interviews written by Lai Chi Kian and Ang Chi Tiong, Isham Al Bakri, a past president and gold medalist of PEM, and the architect appointed by the UAM Renong Group, is quoted, as, is quoted as having said The stadium itself, as you know, is not architecturally interesting. There is nothing to be preserved, really. This is not an architectural heritage. This is historical heritage. So you preserve the spot on, on where it happened, not the building. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? This opinion would have counted at that time. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where I take up the slack and share insights to answer the first question I posted. What went on behind the scenes to set the stage for one of Malaysia's most important conservation projects undertaken to date? The first intimation we got of the salvation of Stadium Merdeka came after a Baden Warisan ex go meeting in 2000. Tun Saji, in his usual cool and enigmatic whispers to us, making it sound like a conspiracy. I have something to tell you. I bought Stadium Medeka and Stadium Nagara from Darna Hatta. And for the first time, I didn't ask the Prime Minister for his permission. Darna Hatta, a debt restructuring committee set up by the government to take over all the non-performing corporate loans caused by the Asian financial crisis, officially transferred the asset to PNB in the year 2001. The next installment of the story came at the following Baden Ryerson Expo meeting, when Sarji said, At our last PNB's trustees meeting, I told the Prime Minister that I had bought the stadium site. Ah, uh -huh. what was his reaction? We all asked in unison. There was very little reaction from him, other than a raised eyebrow and a simple, okay. So we take it that he didn't see it as an act of defiance? Well, Tun Saji, who was the Chief Secretary of the Government in 1993, recalls that he was the only person at the Cabinet meeting who 
who protested against the decision to redevelop the site. He was utterly devastated by the deci decision. I suspect he must have felt it was an act of travesty against the memory of Tunku and a sacrilege to sacrifice a site of such prime cultural significance. Few knew that he was a great fan of Tunku and that he conscientiously collected artifacts related to him. His quote-unquote relationship with Tunku went all the way back to his school days. As a consolation, he was given the mandate to create and curate the Tunku Abdurrahman Putra Memorial on Jalan Hussein On in KL in 1994. Tun Sarji dared to go where others feared the threat. He signed a cheque of 200 million for the site, mainly to save the two precious stadia, and was ready to accept the consequences if he had read the situation wrongly. He inspired me to call him Malaysia's patriot number one, loyal to king and country, with principles reflected in the proclamation of independence. This was when it dawned on me that the site had been given a future. But what form should its future take? So we asked, what are your plans for the two stadia, sir? In a conversation that followed, a plan of action evolved. We suggested that PNB should, one, gazette the two stadia as monuments under the Antiquities Act 1976 to prevent any possibility of demolition in the future. Two, prepare a conservation management plan for the whole site and restore the two stadia back to the period of their highest significance, starting the Stadium Medeca, targeting completion in time for the 50th anniversary of independence. And three, to bequeath the two stadia to a trust to be named the Medeca Heritage Trust. All this happened over time. I recall that the mere idea of being given an opportunity to work on what I would call the conservation project of a lifetime was a dream come true. Thinking about the challenge started to evoke memories of trips to the stadium with my father as a young boy to watch the Baker tournament, the premier soccer tournament in Asia at the time. He was a brainchild of Tunku, a footballer himself in his younger days to use the tournament to commemorate independence. With its unique aura, the, the Madeka tournament not only managed to attract teams from the region, but also famous sites from Europe, Africa, and South America. This tournament took place annually from 1957 until 1988. It was a wonderful and exciting time for me because Come August, I knew I would be watching great rivalries being played out between Malaysia, South Korea, and Japan. And I was privileged to have watched the games live because my father served in the Football Association of Malay with Tunku. This slide is a photograph of the FAM Council at the entrance of the grandstand. My father is the last person on the left seated. As the memories swirled in my head, I thought about how a great sporting event has fallen from grace and faded almost into ex extinction, very much as the stadium had. I feel sad that other generations have never experienced the feeling of unity and patriotism that people from all walks of lives and races felt, sitting together, watching international football games for the first time in a new stadium. This spurred me to craft an opening line on the subject. Why did Tunku choose to dig a hole in the ground to commemorate independence, followed by launching an international football tournament, as opposed to building a high-rise edifice like the Petronas Tomb Towers? But this was Tunku's dream for the new Malaya. The raison d'etre for the stadium, that sports is the greatest leveler, and he wanted to create a venue that could be used by people from all walks of life, located on the site with easy access, especially for the urban poor. We are talking about true equality for all. As a memorial to Madeka, it remains a symbol of Malaysia's multicultural society, promoting cultural integration through sports, recreation, education, and nationhood. 
Self-glorification wasn't to boost down. For this reason, I've always respected and admired him as a leader. I hope the significance and implication is not lost on you. I know, this, I know the significance of loss for many generations after Tunku's demise. I designed a simple questionnaire and tested it out on the hundred school children of different age groups to prove to myself what I suspected. I needed proof that the Ministry of Education had got their priorities wrong. I asked five questions and received a 100% negative response for all five. Do you know what Stadium Merdeka is? No. Do you know where it's located? No. Do you know what the Proclamation of Independence is? No. Do you know how many languages it's written in? No. And do you know how many times Tunku shouted Merdeka on 31st August as he stood on the stage? Answer, no. The results told me that it was even more critical than ever to restore the stadium and to use it as a beacon to shine onto the birthright of all generations of Malaysians. Crafting a vision. The task of crafting a vision and plan was left to me and the executive director, Lisbeth Cardoza, as the restoration proposal had to be approved by the PNB board. As the most significant heritage icon of Malaysia, the owner's mission must be to ensure that all citizens, every man, woman and child, at least once in his or her lifetime, travels by road, rail, or plane to this site as a pilgrim to be told the story of our road to independence and nationhood in the very place that it was declared for the world. But what will they come to see? The stadium was in a dilapidated state with many unsympathetic accretions. It has lost its popularity as a major sports venue as it was known more as a concert venue. The first step was to draft an area conservation management plan, followed by a condition investigation survey of Stadium Merdeka and subsequently the production of building restoration plans. These were based on UNESCO Heritage Awards criteria, which are used to benchmark the conservation works as they proceeded on site. Simultaneously, an application for the segment under the Antiquities Act was submitted to the relevant authorities and approved in 2005. The classifications of building were subsequently changed to National Heritage when the National Heritage Act was promulgated in the same year. Earlier, Tun Saji, with great wisdom, had sought the endorsement of the then Prime Minister Ahmad Badawi, who gave his wholehearted consent to restore the stadium, especially when he was informed that it would be ready for the 50th anniversary of independence in 2007. This was announced in the national media. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the second question. How did Badan Rasan Malaysia craft the conservation approach to ensure it attained the award of excellence in the 2008 UNESCO Asia Pacific Heritage Awards cycle? Having gotten this far, the goal was set for Badan Rasan to be selected as the conservation project manager. My firm, Architect LLA, was appointed as the submitting architect. To avoid the accusation of conflict of interest, my appointment was tabled before the Baden Weissan board and the endorsement was unanimous. Given my conservation experience, Tun Saji was adamant that I take the lead to ensure that the outcome was worthy of a UNESCO award. Of this, I was very confident, having been exposed to the UNESCO awards system since 1999. Prior to the launch of the UNESCO Asia Pacific Heritage Awards for Cultural Heritage Conservation in 2000, Badan had already created its own Heritage Awards scheme, put together with the help of Elizabeth Cordoza and other colleagues in Badan. In 1999, Richard Engelhardt, the former cultural advisor to UNESCO Bangkok, asked me to help put together the rules and criteria for the UNESCO Heritage Awards, which I happily did. I already had a ready template. 
As fate would have it, I submitted for the awards in 2000 in its inaugural year and won the most excellent project for the Chung Fatsi Mansion. I haven't looked back since. One of my favorite lines as an architect is that you're only as good as your clients are. Toon Saji wearing two hats was an exemplary client. On both counts, I was given the mandate and unhindered assistance to do what was absolutely necessary to get things right from the word go. We set up a design conservation production team in Jalan Stone itself and worked seamlessly with the architects from Penang and KL for several years until completion of the project. From submission of building plans, preparation of conservation plans, tender documentation, award and management of the site. We traveled to KL seven times in a month and had to attend all site meetings because we are lumbered with a terrible contractor who we eventually had to sack. As the appointed heritage conservation architect, I had to submit conservation plans to the Commission of Heritage for clearance before they could officially be submitted to Dewan Bandaraya, Kuala Lumpur. When I presented the project, I was very confident that our proposal to restore the stadium back to its period of highest significance would be a consensus view. This meant removing the reinforced concrete upper tiers on the north east and south sides and rebuilding the original toilet blocks on the east side. Lo and behold, when Banan Marasan received a letter of response, we couldn't believe our eyes. Every major element had to be retained as they represented other equally important layers of history. Only a minor strip out of latter-day timber partitions and ad hoc enclosures was permitted. This was reported to the President, who instructed Dr. Ismail Adam, a Baden Ryerson Council member, to approach the Director General of the Ministry of Culture to try to resolve the impasse. Three months later, Badan receives another letter from the Commission of Heritage, stating that we may demolish the upper tiers on the east side, but to keep the north and south tiers a solution which made matters worse. Thereupon, Tun Sarge said not to worry, he would personally speak to the Prime Minister. Three months later, Badan receives a letter stating that our pros proposed plans were approved in total. Too good to be true, but there you have it. On our own, we would never have had the cachet to pull the proverbial rabbit out of the hat. Obviously, Saji was someone to be reckoned with. Our conservation process was guided by the UNESCO Heritage Awards criteria, which covered three areas, and understanding the site and its significance, technical achievement with regard to design, materials, workmanship, and authenticity, and policy and impact, how the influence of the project was on policy and things in the international and international realm arena. I had been teaching a subject at the University of Hong Kong for some time now called Conservation Indicators, where I converted the awards criteria into benchmarks. All my students must have benefited from it. The proof is Hong Kong has won more UNESCO awards per capita than any other place. No sooner had work started on site, we encountered problems with the contractor who had no conservation experience. Luckily, I had anticipated this situation and imposed a penalty system not found in any PAM contract, $10,000 for each single incident of destruction of historical fabric. I put aside a sum of $140,000. Believe it or not, the whole sum was used up very quickly. I remember it was week one, in order to get access to a position on the North Terrace, the contractor demolished a whole rubble wall. And this was after I had done a site walk and had laid down all the ground rules just the day before and explained the conservation protocols included in the contract. The contractor retorted that I could deduct 10,000 
because he thought that was the purpose of the provisional sum. I was speechless. When I recovered, I went on the warpath. Our plug of words was like policemen on site, issuing summon after summon after summon. The word recalcitrant comes to mind because that was the in word then, having been used publicly to describe Dr. Mahathir. Equally frustrating was the caliber of the contractors, supposed project engineers. One incident sums it all up. I had asked for the quantity of mosaic tiles required for the main entrance lobby, as I needed to order replicas from here. Several site meetings later, I still didn't get answered. So I said curtly, what's your problem? Believe it or not, the engineer's reply was, I have to count the number of tiles, and it's taking me a long time because the tiles are very small. By the time I eventually got the answer and sent the order to the engineer, they replied they couldn't meet the order in time because it was the monsoon season and production had stopped. Such stories are endless. Many were to laugh on the call. The countless issues that continued to crop up were taken in our stride as part of the business of construction. Being the heritage crusaders that we were, we struggled on relentlessly, overcoming hurdle after hurdle. By the beginning of 2007, the Jabatan Warisan Nagara was breathing down our necks. The Ministry of Culture, Dato Rice Yatin, had promised that part of the 50th Medica celebrations would be held at the stadium, complete with a hologram of Tunku declaring Medica. For me, it wasn't a particularly happy event. The event planners, under the direction of Japatan Warsan Nagara, left a trail of destruction. They removed all the original MS barriers at the center aisles of the grandstand to create a temporary plywood platform over the whole of lower terraces to see all the sultans, the cabinet, and their wives, which will all have sat on the field like in 1957. If you a chance, watch Restoring Bodeka by History Channel. You will spot that change. Incidentally, as the main character, the cameraman tracked me for one whole year. Unfortunately, all I remember is that I had to wear the same all-white outfit for every shoot. I've always imagined an, a reenactment of all the sultans on the stage in the middle of the field, with a hologram of Tunku shouting Merdeka seven times. It was supposed to have happened on that night. Instead, the hologram was relegated to the southeast corner of the stadium where the red arrow signifies. For reasons best known to the organizers, too far away for the naked eye to make out any details. The drama was lost. Instead, the so-called honor of imitating Tunku was given to the Prime Minister. After the event, construction continued until, until the completion. Meanwhile, the entry dossier for the 2008 UNESCO Heritage Awards was submitted to UNESCO Bangkok. When the results were announced, we learned that we had won the Award of Excellence. Mission accomplished. The citation reads, The restoration of Stadium Madeka, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, has saved a national heritage building and recovered a nation's collective memory. The project has demonstrated a thorough understanding and respect for the significance of the stadium at a specific moment in history and recognition of the historic value of modern architecture. The privately funded rescue effort spearheaded by the Modular National Burkhard with professional assistance from Badan Raishan, Malaysia, serves as a stirring inspiration for civil society around the region in safeguarding heritage sites as part of a shared social and political responsibility. The dossier contains several before and after the past that conveyed to the jurors our conservation accomplishments measured against our stated intentions. This is a view of the grandstand before restoration. They had in fact filled in the arches in between the roofs and the central uh, 
saluting platform had been converted to a VIP box air conditioned when the whole stadium was designed to be tropically ventilated. This is after restoration. This, this is, these are views of the saluting platform which we had to restore back to its original form. A view looking north before and after. Looking at the north stand, they had built upper stairs to, to accommodate the, the Asian Games and put in a, a signboard. We took all of that down to return to, return to the original form. The gates, you could see that over time they had built it up uh, spikes on the ledges increase the height of the fences. So we brought all those down again. The VI stands before and after. And an original photograph taken by Jukes when it was just completed. You can see behind the VI school very, very prominently and also the two uh, toilet blocks. Looking at the south stand before and after, from the arena level, with the south stand removed. There were questions asked of how we could actually remove all these perfectly uh, strong structures, but in fact, uh, God helped us when we went to the site and we checked on the up reinforced concrete work. It was already deteriorating. The grandstand from outside restored back to its original. You'll, you'll note that the awning was originally a striped awning and not blue. And when we stripped back the paint, this is what we actually discovered. This is a much earlier scene of the front of the stadium. This is a view taken by Jukes himself. The main lobby before restoration and after restoration. And here is where I had to find replicas of the original mosaic tiles to re-establish the original floor. The VIP entrance before and after. The upper deck. Some people might remember that that's where you had your fish head curry. The deck restored after. The, the tiers and the timber seating that was provided all around the stadium. We put all of that back. And we rebuilt the toilet blocks that were demolished in order to accommodate the upper tiers. This is a replica of the original signboard that was erected for the Medical Declaration of Independence. Uh, can anybody guess how many states there were originally in Malaya? I'm now repeating the two earlier slides to remind you of what would have been lost. It is logical that the stadium will be integrated at ground level with the Stadium Nagara, Madeka 118, the neighborhood schools and institutions, and the Pataling Street precinct. Madeka Heritage Trust, the owners of the stadium, should step in and play a bigger role in promoting the national heritage status. The trustees owe a duty to the nation to raise its visibility and fulfill its mission. Younger, younger generations have no memory of the duties. They have not yet been born. The proud and heady times of the independence era is only a fact in local history books which hardly comes alive in this reading. We would like to see a gigantic effort to tell the story to all Malaysians every day, every hour, 
over and over again until the place takes on a collective memory for everyone, young and old. It will be told, it will be told in a well-produced interpretation within the stadium itself, a must-see for every visitor to Kuala Lumpur, a site of pilgrimage for all Malaysians to go to, to understand their modern origins, to discover their legacy, and to close the circle which had been broken by political and business decisions. The heritage vision will become a tool to educate, inspire, and foster a sense of pride in our nation, to anchor new generations the concept that they have never been given the chance to understand and internalize in their growing years. I would like to conclude with this slide. When I originally learned that Mahathir had sanctioned the redevelopment project, I couldn't believe my ears. How could he even think of such an ending for Malaysia's most sacred site? It's a given that it should never be demolished. But the unbelievable happened. The stadium was sacrificed for profit. However, on the positive side, it's fortuitous that the crony deal failed because it triggered several critical and timely responses. It allowed Tun Saji and Badan Warisan to intervene and recover the site and to restore it back to its original glory. In doing so, the nation's collective memory has been guaranteed a place in our national consciousness with permanent legal protection under the National Heritage Act and universal recognition by UNESCO. Tuku Abdul Rahman found the dream and then the people. The people, 50 years later, found the leader reincarnated in Tun Saji. Through his leadership, the people have recovered the dream. Let's hope it never ends. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to convey to everyone a very big thank you for taking time off to listen to my story and for making it a memorable for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lawrence, um, for sharing um, such a, a personal experience of um, State of Merdeka and the challenges and the anecdotes um, and all of the things that have led to the preservation of a heritage building. Now, we're going to have the Q&A session. Um, we've received a few questions um, from you. Um, I'm going to start now um, by posing the questions to Lawrence. Um, Lawrence, are you, are, you, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK, perfect, Lawrence. OK, lovely, lovely to have you back. All right, then. So um, the first question that we've received is, um, what year did the restoration project take place? And how long did it take to restore in total? I mean, that number of years, I suppose. We started in the year 2006, if I can recall correctly. And we finished it in just about in 2008. We had done the basic shell in, by 2007. Right. Okay, that was, that's pretty fast then, I mean, in terms of, in terms of the with completion of the restoration. So that's... I'm sure it came from you sort of, you know, the team working quite hard to push up on it. Yeah, we were okay. forced now to. Now the second, sorry? No, go ahead. Um, the second question is, um, since the conservation works have been done, has there been an increase in awareness of the significance of Stadium Merdeka? Hmm. Am I the right person to answer that? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I, I mean, since you, I mean, maybe perhaps when you were, I mean, after the the, the state the restoration was completed, did do you feel that there has been a renewed interest? Uh, in the I, I think not, because no. after after that, PNB started to embark on their redevelopment of the site, mm. Madeka One One Eight, right, and so they yes. had to, in fact, uh, scale down and and a lot of the activities in the stadium. 
And so now it's in fact a secondary site. Mm. I guess when they finish the project, they will yeah. start to reactivate it. Okay. All right then. Well, I suppose then the, the last question is probably sort of would tie in with what you're saying. That is, what do you think is going to happen to Stadium Merdeka in the future? It is a beautiful building, but underused. So, um, yeah, I suppose that ties up, ties in with what you've just said, right? Yeah, but again, the, the question goes back to PNP, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. My, my um, wish is that they will take uh, cognizance of the fact that they have a wonderful heritage site. Okay. It's full of uh, memories for many, many people. It has very many values and it would only help to activate their power if they do something with the stadium and the setting around the tower. Okay. So, um, okay, there's another question. Um, is the equally significant stadium Radeka being treated with the same level of conservation? How about reverting to the old roof and removing the Astrodome? You're talking about Stadium Negara, right? Yeah, um, Stadium Negara, Stadium yeah. Negara. That, that, that has also been proposed. In fact, um, Fix City, together with my, my company, we have prepared a conservation management plan that has been submitted to PNB. And in it, we have proposed some modification of the roof to revert to a form that is pretty similar to what it was before, mm. but in a much improved version. Okay. But I think I, I think not many people will know what the the person submitting the question is actually asking. Uh, maybe I'll just explain quite quickly. Before they had a almost like a flat roof, mm. right? And subsequently, because it was leaking, they dismantled that and put a dome on top of it. So I think that the person submitting the question is asking whether we would actually uh, return it to its original form. Mm. Mm. Okay. Right. Um, let me. There are quite a number of questions coming through. So I think we're just gonna we're gonna probably have question um, time for maybe one more question. I think. I mean, let me see which one without. Here we go. Um, Did the restoring of Stadium Medeca, the Stadium Medeca project, involve QS profession, QS, QS uh, quantity surveyors? In, were they involved in that? And what is the final contract sum for this restoration project, including VO? I don't know. I mean, I, I can't <laughs> imagine you would have this this figure on you at this point. Um, I, I must admit, I I don't write, quite recall now. Mm. It was so long ago. We did sure. have a quantity surveyor. Right. And I think all I can say is that we brought it in within budget. Mm. Okay. Okay. And one more, I think one more, time for one more question. Um, I think this is, I think a lot of people are wondering about this. What is the impact of the PNB um, 11, Medeca, one, is it 118, Medeca 118 building in relation to the lower, to the heritage buildings around, I'm assuming Chinatown? Um, in, in that area, how do you feel the impact of um, the the tower has? Was it the impact the tower has? Okay, I think we have to go back a bit to to ask why is the tower there? Right. Mm. Earlier in my talk, I I mentioned that Tun Saji actually signed a check for two hundred million. Mm. Right. Uh, we know that. His heart was in the right place. He wanted yeah. to save the two stadium, but he had to make the equation work, right? He, his reasoning was he bought a beautiful piece of land with a lot of empty land around two stadium. Mm. So somebody had to build something on it. So the form that you get, mm. in fact, reflects the plot ratio that is uh, that any developer is entitled to. It right. could have been three towers, it could have been one tower. To me, it's an immaterial. It, it was something that had to happen. And I think the public should appreciate that. 
I think no, no, no boss of PNB could say, "Hey, I'm just going to spend two hundred million, and I'm just going to keep the site empty." You know? Yeah, of course. So now it's up to uh, PNB to ensure that the tower, especially at ground level, uh, actually blends seamlessly with the rest of the area. Mm. And this is something that is happening because Think City has been. Uh, invited to work with them to look at that aspect of it, right? And how to make it inclusive, how to make it uh, connect with all the other sites to make sure that the, the tower is not an island, but it's really part and parcel of the whole neighborhood. Sure, it's, it's a bit sum, but with uh, will and skill, I think it can be made to happen. Fantastic. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. And I think that's thank you, Lawrence, for being with thank us you. today and for so kindly and patiently answering all the questions. There are many, many more questions, but I'm afraid we don't we don't have time for that. So um, thank you everybody for being with us. I'm just gonna leave you just by saying that Baranwari San Malaysia um, is the has is um, the Her National Heritage Trust of Malaysia is the leading NGO with a reputation for excellence in heritage conservation services and it's been around for 30 years. We're an independent registered charity and our role is to raise awareness of heritage issues and to advocate for a conservation friendly environment in Malaysia. Please donate to what we're doing. And if you aren't already a member, please join us to assist us in the work that we do. We are all volunteers who are passionate and committed to preserving and conserving both the tangible and intangible assets of this beautiful and diverse country. Our office is located at number eight, two Dallanstone KL. So please, you know, if you're around, please drop in to say hello. If you would like to volunteer in areas such as fundraising, research, conservation, heritage tours, community gardening, or architecture, we welcome you with open arms. We want Badam Warisan Malaysia to be as inclusive as possible. We are an organization for Malaysians. Also, please remember to fill in the survey so that we know how to improve our webinars. And please tell us what you would like to learn more about, and we will try our best to meet your expectations. Before I leave, we will be sending out a special PDF, compliments of Adam Warris son, on the personal memoirs of Mr. Lee Kwok Tai for your further reading. I do hope you'll continue to join us at our future webinars. I'm now going to leave you with a video by Think City. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with us today. And thank you, Think City, for, the, for helping us out with this webinar. Thank you.